Good evening and welcome to the live telecast of Bridging Asia to Singapore Debates on Channel News Asia. I'm your moderator, Gaurav Kirti. Some people call this the Asian century, but there are some serious questions we need to answer first. We've invited some prominent thinkers to debate the key issues facing Asia now, and our first topic is corruption. In 2011, China's former railway minister was accused of embezzling more than 120 million US dollars. India's former telecommunications minister is in jail over a 2G license sale scandal. And even Hong Kong and Singapore have been hit by corruption scandals in 2012. Is Asia getting more corrupt? Or is corruption just getting more exposed and prosecuted? The debate tonight, Can Asia Beat Corruption? We polled the studio audience and our visitors to the Bridging Asia website before the debate. Let's take a look. 41% believe, yes, Asia can beat corruption, but 59% believe that, no, it cannot. You can log on to the website to cast your vote. You can also change your vote during the course of the debate. The winner tonight will be decided by your vote. In this season, we've added a panel of judges who will be commenting on the team's persuasiveness. First up, Mr. Chelvaraja, Senior Counsel at Tan Raja and Chia and Singapore's non-resident commissioner to Papua New Guinea. Next, Ms. Eleanor Wong, playwright and associate professor in the law faculty at the National University of Singapore. And Mr. Adrian Tan, the director of dispute resolution at Singapore law firm Drew and Napier. Thank you all for joining us, and we trust that none of you can be bribed in this very important debate. <laughs> Why not try us? <laughs> now let's meet our panel of speakers. The first speaker arguing that Asia can beat corruption is Professor Mark Thompson, a professor of politics and the director of the Southeast Asia Research Center at City University of Hong Kong. Supporting him is Mr. Wilson Ang, a lawyer at Norton Rose, who was named the 2011 Anti-Corruption Lawyer of the Year in Singapore. Now arguing against them and making the case that Asia cannot beat corruption is Tunku Abdul Aziz Ibrahim. Tunku Aziz is the founding member of Transparency International Malaysia. He also authored a book on his fight against corruption. The second speaker of the negative is Dr. Anne Florini, who is a professor of public policy at the Singapore Management University and author of numerous books on Asia. Now the first speakers from each side will have three minutes to open their case and present their arguments. They will then have one minute of rebuttal time each to respond to the other speakers. Now let's get this debate started. Professor Thompson, you wrote about corruption almost a decade ago. What gives you confidence now that Asia can beat corruption? Your three minutes begins now. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I understand it's a new format this year, and uh, we've already heard no use trying to offer inducements uh, to the judges or anybody else because of the nature of the topic. Um, actually, I grew up near Chicago, and there the mayor would say, if I can't help my friends and family, who can I help? So I'm only too well aware of how intractable corruption can be and how difficult it can be to break a culture of impunity. I want to offer in these brief remarks uh, two reasons why we might have reasons for optimism f about uh, combating corruption in Asia. The first regards the logic of development. Some China insiders and also outside observers believe that in early stages of development, corruption may grease the wheels, provide lubricant, uh, open up a closed system, bypassing an inefficient bureaucracy, uh, protecting nation capitalists in an environment of uncertain property rights. But there's a growing sense that such arguments have literally been outgrown. As China becomes a middle-income country, an increasingly complex society, it's clear that corruption now hinders growth, blocks efforts to upgrade the economy, and preserve political stability. And if we take the examples of Taiwan and South Korea, which as developmental states are a couple of decades ahead of China in these processes, their successful efforts to reduce corruption significantly have been seen as instrumental in both countries uh, deepening their technological capacity as well as restoring political legitimacy. Secondly, there's the issue of the impact of transparency. 
When non-democratic systems have failed, and I'm thinking, for example, uh, of the Suharto regime that collapsed in the 1990s in Indonesia or the Marcos regime in the Philippines in the 1980s, there's sometimes a sense of disillusionment. Not enough has been done to combat corruption. There was a hope that uh, the, the bribery would go out with the dictator. But over time, the effect of anti-corruption drives, greater media scrutiny, and civil society activism comes to be seen as more positive. In Indonesia, Bangladesh, and even the Philippines, often seen as one of the most corrupt, if not the most corrupt, East Asian country, there have been signs of improvement, and this has often been attributed to growing transparency. In the case of the Philippines, some people say it's the new president, but it's also the culmination of efforts through press muckraking of scandals, uh, of citizen action, for example, following up to make sure textbooks are actually delivered to schools as government promises, uh, that have helped uh, improve, albeit from a, a low base, uh, the performance of government, raising consciousness about governance and improving standards. It's a long battle, it's a, it's, it's a, a slow process, but I think there are for these two reasons uh, uh, grounds so much, for optimism. Thank you Professor Thompson, Thank I have you. to stop you there. Next up we have Tunku Aziz. Tunku Aziz, you spent many years trying to battle corruption. Do you agree with his logic of development, the logic of corruption? Your three minutes begins now. Well, certainly not. <laughs> um, I, I've seen enough uh, through my work um, with Transparency International um, that uh, there is no way Asia can beat corruption with some exceptions, obviously. Singapore is a prime example in Hong Kong. But you will see that most of these countries, which are high up on the index, uh, tend to be small, affluent, very well-run countries. So good governance obviously has a very important role to play. Where you don't have good governance, there is no way, there's no chance for these countries to uh, kick corruption. I'm not talking about eliminating corruption because that is an impossibility. I'm now talking simply of reducing corruption. Now, although um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to rebut now, but uh, there are the examples which have been given of Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and so on and so forth. Uh, Bangladesh. I mean, these are, these are countries uh, which have for probably, you know, well, 50, 60 years been right at the bottom of the league. And um, uh, these are also countries which are very badly run. There is no governance to speak of that you uh, in Singapore understand it. Now, the countries that, uh, that are really, uh, um, you know, sitting at the top table in Asia, uh, I'm not going to talk about India or China, uh, because um, Anne is going to do that. But let's take South Korea. Now, a lot of people think that South Korea is making tremendous progress. Well, it is making some progress, but South Korea remains a very corrupt society. Uh, Taiwan is doing a lot better um, than, than uh, they were years ago, but they still remain problematic. Thailand, uh, the Philippines. Now, Indonesia, for example, I've done some work in Indonesia, and um, a, a great friend of mine who used to be the last expatriate uh, director of ICAC in Hong Kong, Bertram Despevel, very well known uh, corruption fighter. Now of all the countries in which he's done work, including Eastern Europe, he said there is no country such as Indonesia that he has come across. Tunku Aziz, unfortunately we're going to have to end the time there, but you have a minute afterwards. But we'll move first to Professor Thompson. You have interesting arguments so far, and you have one minute to respond, either to attack some of the points he's made or to defend your own case. Professor Thompson, your one minute begins thanks, now. Thanks. I, you know, I I agree with, with, with many of the things that have just been said. I, I think to clarify, our, the position of our side is we're not claiming things are good, but just that they're getting somewhat better. And 
even in some of the worst cases, and I think clearly the Philippines, Bangladesh, and Indonesia are some of the most corruption-plagued countries in the world, there are signs that through NGOs, such as Transparency International, uh, through the activities of campaigners against corruption, through certain technocrats, honest uh, government officials who are trying to make a difference. There are signs of improvement. And in terms of Taiwan and South Korea, yes, they still have problems with corruption, but they're much better than they were before. They're moving up the, that corruption league table. Uh, they're still below the, some of the most uh, uh, corruption-free countries in, in Europe and, and so on. But they've moved up. They're f far above these other cases we talked about. And that, I think, we can fairly attribute to some of their successes also economically. So it's, it's, it's a process of developing economically, but at the same time understanding you to, to make progress. Thank you so much, Professor. You have to We're going to have to combat corruption. There. Yeah. Thank you. Tunku Aziz, do you agree with his perspective? You have one minute to make your case. Your time begins now. Well, I'm afraid, you know, I'm less sanguine than Mr. Thompson. Um, I have seen, uh, you know, uh, a lot of examples of corruption. Uh, Indonesia, as, as a case, what they've done now through this process of uh, uh, devolution, corruption which used to be centered on Jakarta, has now moved across all over Indonesia. So corruption is spreading. And, you know, NGOs are fine, but I think they are, and I wish they were more effective, but NGOs in the fight against corruption uh, you know, are not, unfortunately, uh, effective, uh, you know, to make, to make a real difference. Thank you so much, Tunku Aziz. Well, the teams have opened their arguments, and now let's move over to the judges. Shalvaraja, what do you think of the case so far? Well, as I understand the, the yes side's arguments, they are saying that uh, there is a good chance or every prospect of Asia becoming less and less corrupt as it becomes more and more developed, as uh, it becomes uh, more and more educated, and as it becomes more and more uh, democratized. That seems to be the basis of their argument. But why exactly this should be so is not quite clear to me just yet. On the other side, <clears throat> we have the, the naysayers, and they, their arguments, as I understand it, is that, uh, oh, there's no way Asia can become corruption-free, but with a few exceptions. And what are these exceptions? They are countries which are well-run. Well, <clears throat> are they then saying that Asian countries will never be well-run? And if so, why? So, so uh, the... Uh, uh, I'm waiting for the rest of the debate for this to unfold. Well, I thought it was really great that um, you know the, both sides have engaged with each other. I love the underdog, so I'm going to ask um, you know the negative. I'm, I'm surprised actually that Tom uh, Guazis is quite so uh, despondent because by the you know statistics of his own Transparency International, many of the countries that he talked about today are in the top half of the, the league tables uh, recently, and actually not that many countries um, in Asia are in the bottom. So I, th I think that you may be arguing against your own case to some extent. And a quick one from Adrian Tan. Um, a great opening to the debate. Um, after listening to both sides, I am firmly on the fence on this <laughs> one. Um, that Profe must hurt. Yes, it, it is a bit. Yeah, yeah. But Professor Thompson, um, you, said, you said development um, is, is antithetical to um, corruption, and yet you started off the Chicago example. Now, you, you may criticize Chicago, but it's fairly well developed. And uh, Tunku Aziz, um, I, I follow your argument, but it seems that you are saying that the work of your own organization, Transparency International, is ultimately futile. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd just like to explore that later on. Well, it's been a good start to a tough topic. Professor Thompson thinks that things are getting better, but perhaps it's too slow. Tunku Aziz argues that, well, there are some really badly run countries, but clearly some have made it through. Who do you believe more? While you ponder that question, it's time for a quick break, and when we come back, we'll hear from the second speakers and we'll take your questions. Stay with us. Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. 
We're debating the question, can Asia beat corruption? We heard from the first speakers before the break. Now let's hear from their teammates. Mr. Wilson Ang is up first. Mr. Ang, we've seen big Western companies like Siemens being prosecuted for bribing regional officials. Do you think the change is afoot and that Asia really can beat corruption? Mr. Ang, your three minutes begins now. Thank you. I think Asia is at an inflection point right now. I think we are poised to emerge stronger than ever before. I'm a bit perplexed by Tunku Aziz's um, uh, expression that, uh, that com- countries in Asia are, are, are hopeless, that there are only very few exceptions. But my firm belief is that these exceptions are increasingly going to become the norm for two reasons, and let me state them. The first is the increasing legal convergence and the aggressive enforcement of anti-corruption laws. And that, you pointed out to Siemens, that was a 2008 case, made a huge, uh, huge impact uh, on the anti-corruption landscape. These laws have effected a radical change. The ag- aggressive enforcement of the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, for bribes paid outside of the U.S., as well as the passing of the new U.K. Bribery Act, sets out, which sets out even more stringent prohibitions against all kinds of bribery, including those pay- based, uh, paid in Asia, have fundamentally changed the way business is conducted here. These laws are extraterritorial, they are far-reaching, and they are sending chills down the spines of senior management. And more importantly, the laws of Asia themselves are starting to change. China has changed its laws. India and Indonesia are looking to change their laws to make them more stringent. Cambodia has a new anti-corruption law coming into force. The enforcement of these laws may be patchy, but they are all steps in the right direction. Now, these developments for the naysayers are not random. They are not coincidental. They are collective actions taken in response to international pressure exerted through multilateral organizations like the United Nations and OECD as a result of the conventions and treaties that these countries have signed up to. My second point, which is related, is that there are increasing levels of awareness and corporate policing that is taking place right now. The level of awareness for for zero tolerance of corruption is rapidly rising. Recently in Singapore, we heard from our very own Prime Minister that we will not tolerate corruption in any form. But apart from the stringent laws in place and the awareness of these sentences being handed down, is the important role of anti-corruption advocates like Transparency International, the use of social media um, that is shedding more light on corruption cases and giving more information. Now, sex, chairs and bicycles. Well, these were not heard in the same sentence previously, but now they're making headlines on the internet. There is now a risk also that your business partner and your competitors can blow the whistle on you. People are now shining a light on conduct that was previously in the dark. We are debating a topic like this on national TV, Channel News Asia. Now, the development of of the compliance industry, of the level of awareness that is rising, gives us the position that we now in Asia more than ever can actually beat corruption. Now, that is a hope that I think we can hold on to. Thank you so much, Mr. Ang. Well, arguing the negative, we have Dr. Anne Florini. Dr. Florini, the the lawyer seems to think that uh, law is going to be the solution. Do you agree with him? Do you think that Asia can beat corruption? Unfortunately, no. And I think it's partly because I am a political scientist and not a lawyer. Lawyers think that laws matter because they exist. Political scientists think laws are tools that are used by political forces, and sometimes they are implemented and sometimes they are not. I'm afraid I have to disagree rather strongly with Dr. Thompson. I think he has it backwards. It is not that societies develop into better governance as they get richer. It is that societies that are fairer and cleaner to start with are the ones that become richer. So the causation, I think, works the other way around. In fact, I think, unfortunately, it is the case that what we now call corruption has been the norm in human society throughout history. It is the norm that small groups of people grab the levers of power and maintain their death grip on those levers of power. And it takes a very unusual concatenation of circumstances to get them out. If, for example, you go back and you look at how is it that the Industrial Revolution took place in England? How is it that the political space opened up, that you got development of this much broader, fairer set of rules in England? Well, you'd have to look at the Black Death, the storm that destroyed the Spanish Armada, a whole series of idiosyncratic circumstances that together created a lot of political space. And even then, it took centuries of strife, very hard political work, before you got this more open, broad political space. 
and all societies that have made that leap into good governance and high income status still remain very vulnerable to the forces of corruption. So what does this mean now for Asia? Is it likely that Asia is going to have this political opportunity, this political space? Well, if you look at China, uh, social organizing of the kind that is necessary to address corruption is actively discouraged. There's a lot of complaining in the blogosphere, but complaining in the blogosphere is not the same as political organization. Occasionally, the government responds to something that is particularly egregious, but the massive levels of corruption are not improving in China at all. Despite the fact that laws are being passed, there's no system, there's no set of effective, universally applied rules, there are no political institutions that can counter the forces toward corruption. In India, there's lots of social organizing in a relatively open political space, but we're not seeing the kind of effective, sustained social campaigns that are necessary to bring very large-scale corruption under control. And in both cases, it is easier for the people who are affected by corruption to take their assets themselves, their opportunities overseas, than it is to deal with the problems at home. There is also the problem that it is not at all clear whether the traditional forces in favor of anti-corruption around the world, such as the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, are going to continue to be all that influential. Mm -hmm. It is not at all clear that the U.S. is going to go on acting as policeman of the world, nor that so it is going to keep its own corruption under control. We now move to the one-minute response speeches where both the second speakers can respond to what they just heard or defend their own case. Mr. Rang, your one minute begins now. Thank you. I just want to make a very quick point um, that law is not important in your views in terms of implementing an effective change. I will respond to that and I respond to that very strongly because for people who are sitting in front of a dock, they are in the witness stand. They are being faced with prosecution. They are having the light shine, sh uh, shining on their faces. There is no way that you can tell them the law is not important. Now, these are the very same people who are looking at the headlines. They are looking at the major fines. They are looking at time in jail. Now, that is a very important motivating factor for change, I would argue. Um, you have mentioned also about China and that laws are not being properly implemented and that systems and institutions are, are, are weak. Um, and again, uh, laws may be strict elsewhere. In China, you actually face the firing squad. And I think that's a very severe and, and significant deterrent. In terms of the law being a tool for the politicians, I would say that things like the Arab Spring, social media has actually effected change that will now capitalize and crystallize the political will for change for these politicians to want to remain in power. Th thank you so much, Mr. Ang. Dr. Florini, you have one minute. Your time begins now. Very important to make clear, I did not say that law is not important. I said that law by itself is not going to be a sufficient solution. Law has to be applied fairly and broadly in order to have a powerful impact, and in many societies, in most societies, it is not applied fairly and broadly. As long as that remains the case, you can have the best laws in the world, but you are not going to deal with the problem of corruption. However, I take the point that if you don't have a good legal system, you have essentially no hope of dealing with corruption. In terms of the Chinese penalties for corruption, yes, occasionally someone gets executed. The vast majority of the people who are engaged in highly corrupt acts, in personal self-aggrandizement, in gathering wealth, are not being shot. They are in, very often, relatively high positions of power. And the use of the laws and the use of these extreme penalties in China is not done in order to control corruption. It is part of the political process. Thank you so much, Dr. Farini. So we've had a really good clash now, both speakers directly disagreeing with each other. Judges, what do you think? Elna? Well, I'm, uh, it's hard for me as a lawyer myself to uh, disagree with Wilson, but I'll try to do so. And I think that, um, you know, there may be laws, but the, the bottom line is the will to enforce them. And here I may have to go with, um, the, with history, because uh, I agree, actually, and I, and I found it quite convincing that uh, history shows that uh, corruption may well be part of the human DNA. But I'd like to ask the negative to consider that maybe if that's the case, um, do we need to question some of the assumptions that we come here? I mean, should we combat corruption if it is in fact part of the human DNA? Might be a question that's not for tonight, but for some other talk over coffee. I, I'm really getting uh, into this debate. I think Professor Thompson kicked it off by saying the more developed you are, 
the less need you will have for corruption to fix the inadequacies of the system. And Dr. Florini came right back and said, actually, that's not the way it is. It's the other way around. The more transparent and fair you are, the better developed you will be. And I'm wondering whether one feeds into the other so that it is a cycle. And I'd like to explore that relationship. I, of course, enjoyed Wilson's, um, Wilson Ang's um, explanation on the law. He's quite right that um, there has been many developments of the law. And um, it's, it's a sign. I, I take it that, in itself, uh, development of the law doesn't solve many things. But it is a, a symptom of what society aspires to. Um, and I also appreciate his relationship between um, Siemens and corruption. Well, I, I find that there is one point that both sides appear to agree on, that if you're going to fight or defeat corruption in Asia, you must have anti-corruption laws that are clear, pervasive, and, and, and uh, fairly wide uh, encompassing. But where they part company is that uh, the naysayers say, look, you can have the best law in the world, but if you don't apply it fairly, in fact, if you use it to fix the other guy up, because everybody is corrupt, you know, so if any opponent, political opponent of yours can be fixed up by charging him with corruption and getting him executed, it becomes an instrument of oppression. So uh, uh, who is right? We'll wait and see. So the corrupt are using the tools of uh, anti-corruption in their own be benefit. Absolutely. And one might even argue that some of these rules were forced onto Asian companies by, you know, development banks. Now, isn't that a corruption of its own? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all very complicated, but we've got some great speakers arguing these issues. The poll is still running, and there's been a slight increase in the number of you who say Asia can beat corruption. Currently, the poll stands at 46.4% saying yes it can and 53.6% saying no Asia cannot beat corruption so some change is afoot please remember to vote now we've heard all the speakers and it seems that on the side of the proposition here Professor Thompson and Mr. Ang feel that it's important to have the structures in place law enforcement is important and things are getting better the question still remains are they getting better at a pace that is sufficiently fast or will it take a long time to go on the other side, we have a view that Asian countries, unfortunately, are too far behind, that the structures, even if they're put in place, are not going to be enforced, and it's going to be a long time before Asian countries can claim to have beaten corruption. We've got some time for questions from the audience and from our home viewers who've been sending in their questions via the website. Maybe we can take a quick question from one of the audience members. Do we have anybody daring enough to ask a question? We have one question in front. I'm, uh, thank you very much, uh, debaters. I'm enjoying the debate. And I'm just wondering, um, maybe a fundamental question is whether uh, you are think taking into account the differences in culture between the definition and understanding and perception of what corruption is. For example, the Asian versus the Western understanding of what constitute legitimate doing a favor for somebody, the Guan Si issue, relationship, and corruption. So without that clear definition and understanding, I'm not sure if I understand what's going on. Thank you so much. Actually, perhaps I'll address that question to the affirmative because we have another question online which is very similar. Is corruption an unintended manifestation of our Asian values? So, like he asked, is it just something that's culturally acceptable? Is our definition and understanding correct? Tunku Aziz, perhaps you'd like to take a chance? Well, um, I, I don't buy that because there is no culture in the world that I know of, or religion for that matter, that encourages you to be corrupt. I think that's the first point. And, and, and secondly, this whole idea of you know, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. This was something that large European companies in particular used to tell their marketing directors, when you go out east, bribe. This is the culture of the people out there. Now, when, when I was on the board of Transparency Internet, this was one thing that I fought hard against. 
I said, you know, don't think that we in Asia invented corruption. So I don't accept that. I think culturally, you know, we are as good as anyone else in the world. So it is not an Asian uh, uh, habit. It's not part of our Asian culture. Thank you so much for that response. So corruption is not a uniquely Asian problem. It's just a human problem that is manifesting in Asia. Before we go for another break, let's take a quick look at our poll. Looks like the uh, discussion just now changed the numbers a little bit. 46.3% say yes, and 53.7% say no, Asia cannot beat corruption. When we come back, more questions from the audience and our viewers. Stay with us. The Pope's butler said to tell... Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. I'm Gaurav Kirthi. We've got a great panel of prominent thinkers debating whether or not Asia can beat corruption. It's a close fight between the two teams. Remember that you have a say in who will win this debate. The poll right now stands, well, 48.1% say yes, 51.9% say no. It's getting closer and closer. And if you're still waiting to be persuaded, now's your chance. We have a question from some of our home viewers, and you can pose your own questions online. The question is, is corruption ever justified? So let me say that again. Is corruption ever justified? And I'm going to throw this over to Professor Thompson. What are your thoughts? Is corruption ever justified? Well, no. And we've, we've, we've seen the, uh, the arguments that go cut across cultures. And if I may address the issue of Chicago, even in Chicago, uh, after a while, people began to realize that uh, the corruption at its limits and the press played a big role, one columnist in particular, uh, attacking this uh, culture of impunity in that particular American city. Transparency is needed, uh, and that's the point we were making in response to uh, Dr. Florini. The transparency is needed, not just modernization. Actually, that's our argument. It's a mixture of the two. As countries are modernizing, they need to become increasingly transparent, otherwise their modernization process will be blocked by poor governance. That's what South Korea and Taiwan achieved. That's the challenge that China faces. Dr. Florini, we have another question, and it's, it's something that I think you might be interested in. Is corruption that big a deal? Can't we just say it's a necessary evil for developing countries that'll go away eventually with modernization? So touching on the argument you raised earlier, your oh. thoughts? Corruption is definitely an evil, but it is not a, a necessary one that we should just allow to ha have happen. This gets back to the judge's question about should we worry about it? Absolutely, because think who suffers from it. It's the poorest. It's the most vulnerable. It, there is nothing I would like better than to be proved wrong about my pessimism about corruption, not just in Asia, but in the world, the world more at large. It is, it is not the case, I think, that this increasing transparency that Dr. Thompson referred to is in itself going to be a sufficient solution because the kind of transparency you get that we're seeing spread a lot is limited to certain kinds of economic information. It's not this broader kind of political accountability and systems of allowing voice that are necessary if you're going to truly get fair and broad application of the rule of law. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the audience members? Okay, maybe take the gentleman in front in the brown shirt. Um, in, a, in response to the point you made earlier about how political will is needed to enforce certain legal rules necessary for transparency, do you think then that there's enough political clamor on the ground to help bring about this change? And on, on the second point, how is affluence, um, is there a link between affluence of the general population and political clamor for greater for the fight against corruption. I see you looking very closely at Tunku Aziz. So Tunku Aziz, perhaps you'd like to answer that? Well, as I said um, earlier, uh, I think you know, the important thing is <coughs> to have good governance in place. Now imagine Singapore without Mr. Lee Kuan Yew to begin with. I think you know, if we would have taken, Singapore would have taken a totally different road if you had a bunch of rogues running Singapore. So political will is terribly important. 
Now, what do we mean by political will? Political will really uh, means, effectively, that you want to put in place best practices. Now, without good governance, you won't have an independent judiciary. You won't have a corruption-free, or at least, you know, very much reduced, uh, police and all the other national institutions. Without good governance, there will be no strong national institution. Fighting corruption is about putting in place strong national institutions which are really an aid to fighting corruption. So, you know, as a result of good governance, Singapore has been able, I'm using Singapore because I'm here, been able to attract a lot of foreign investments. You have more foreign investors in Singapore than many other countries put together. Why? Because they have confidence in the system of arbitration in Singapore. Your judicial system, I mean, you know, it's not 100% perfect, but people can rely on it, you know, to give fair judgment. So, this, I'm yes. just going to have to interrupt you right there, but we have a question that's quite relevant to this uh, from the internet, yeah. and I'm going to direct this actually at Mr. Ang. Mm. Would having higher salaries help in beating corruption? That seems to be the way for Singapore. Would it work for other Asian countries? Mr. Ang? Well, I think in, 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 it, it is clearly a question that um, uh, doesn't have a simple answer to, because uh, salaries and money is just one aspect of gratification, as we can see there are various other aspects of it too. And if that, that is an aspect that I believe in Singapore we dealt with head on. Uh, in other countries, they might not have had the political will to do it. But coming back to the point that um, Tunkul Aziz mentioned that good governance is important, institutions are important, I don't disagree with all that. I think where we disagree perhaps is where, whether there is political will to get to the point of good governance. And I think that political will is exactly there when you are able to look at examples like Singapore that you mentioned where, where a, a poor country which was corrupt in the 50s and the 60s mm -hmm. is able to get its act together, put together, in fact, the Corruption, the Prevention of Corruption Act, um, get that together, institute and formulate and put together a, an independent crime-fighting uh, anti-corruption uh, investigations bureau. And, and they, we have set the blueprint. So it is not impossible. Asian countries are looking to emulate Singapore in many ways, I have to say. And I'm hoping that this is yet another way that we will be an example to the rest. So I don't, I'm not despondent uh, at all. And I think, I think that actually proves that the exception can be the norm. Thank you so much. Viewers at home, do remember to cast your vote because your vote decides who's going to win this debate. Can Asia beat corruption? Go to this website below and cast your vote. Let's look at the results as it stands right now. It's getting closer and closer. 49.1% believe yes, Asia can beat corruption, and 50.9% believe no. It's extremely evenly matched, so your vote is very critical. Log in now and make your vote count. Okay, time for another quick break, and when we come back, the closing arguments and then the final vote. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debate. We've been debating the question of whether or not Asia can beat corruption. Have you chosen your side yet? It's time now for each speaker to wrap up their case in just one minute. The judges have already said that there are still some unresolved issues, so hopefully we can get closer to a resolution and help break the very close tie online. Let's start with the affirmative side. Professor Thompson, please summarize why you think Asia can beat corruption. Your one minute begins now. Thanks very much. I, just to make it very clear, we recognize there's still much work to be done, uh, but perhaps there's been more progress in terms of combating corruption than's often been recognized. That's one reason I took some of the most extreme cases of corruption, uh, countries that are not noted for good governments, and shown even there we have some signs of progress. Transparency and accountability are crucial. Modernization, economic growth itself, may be of, uh, of some help, but crucial, particularly as countries reach middle-level incomes, is that they increase the possibilities for not just 
laws, although they're very important, as uh, Wilson has pointed out, and, and that's a very important aspect. It's also important to have societal, civil societal pressure to enforce those laws, to make sure those laws are enforced fairly. And as Asian societies modernize, the most successful countries, and that's why the, the case of South Korea and Taiwan, they still have a lot of work to do, uh, have so achieved much. Singapore and Hong right Kong there. the most, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Tunku Aziz, your one-minute closing remarks. Well, listening to, um, to the other side, I you know, thought for a minute that I might be persuaded. Uh, but I am still unconvinced because I believe that there is a lot more uh, work to be done which, uh, by its very nature, will take some time. It is a process, remember. It's not a product that you can go into a supermarket and say, I like a pound of integrity, I like another pound or one kilo of this and then the other. This is something that the whole nation has to be involved in. It's not just a fight for government agencies. It's a fight for everybody. You know, you may win a battle here and there, but when you fight corruption, you're fighting a war. And it is not easy, let me tell you this. Thank you so much, Tunku Aziz, speaking really from personal experience. We now move over to the closing remarks from the affirmative side. Ms. Rang, your one minute begins now. Thank you. I have a great deal of respect for those who have put in their life's efforts to do the right thing. And tonight's context, that is to fight corruption. And I think it can be in the form of devising systems and structures like Dr. Florini has done through academic think tanks, or setting up civil society organizations as Tunku Aziz has done. Both of them are great examples of those who have invested their lives to beat corruption because they believe they can make the world a better place. Tunku Aziz has written a book on fighting corruption, my mission. So for tonight, for five brief minutes, they have sought to argue a somewhat pessimistic message to you that no, Asia cannot beat corruption. But please, I implore you all that don't hold it against them because action speaks louder than words. And in fact, it demonstrates, their action demonstrates the very opposite which is the firm belief that Asia can beat corruption. Thank you so much, Ms. Rang. And now, to wrap up the debate as a whole, Dr. Florini, your one minute begins now. Mr. Ong, I very much wish I could agree with you that our efforts are going to make that much difference, but I remain pessimistic. The argument has been made that countries look to the model of Singapore and want to emulate it, but a country doesn't act. A country is a fiction. It, it, a country's decision makers are individuals, and the question is what incentives, what opportunities, what systems do they face? If you have a small handful of those who are more publicly spirited, in a small country they can make a difference. In a large country it takes much more than that. And when you already have very strong vested interests that have control, it's extremely hard to wrest that control away from them. You get that outcome, you get the control away from them, when something shakes up a society, as war sh shook up Japan and South Korea before you got the kind of changes that you saw there. And at the same time, you have to have some political force that's poised to seize the opportunity, whether it's outside occupiers or inside social forces. Do we have that in Asia? I'm not so sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Florini. And thank you all four. We've got some optimists and some well, realists in the uh, speakers. <laughs> Before we get to the final vote, let's see what the judges thought of how the speakers did. Mr. Adrian, please, perhaps you could start. Thanks to all the speakers. Can Asia beat corruption? And in this battle between uh, the dreamers and the cynics, I came away with, with one problem. And my problem is this. There was a very crucial question from the floor. And the question was this. Is corruption a cultural construct? Is it something unique to Asian culture? And the clear answer from the negative side is no, there is no culture that has a monopoly on corruption. But if that's the case, if corruption is not unique to Asian culture, why is there more of it here than in the West? And the underlying argument from the negative side is this. Well, you can have all the laws in the world, you can have all the judges, but if you don't have the political will, then you can't beat corruption. So the follow-up question is this. So why can't Asia have that political view. Is there something wrong with our backbone? Is there something in the water or the air we breathe? I don't see any difference between the fight that's going on in the West and the fight that's going on here. So your final vote would go I'm to? I'm going with the dreamers. The dreamers? Excellent. Yes. Yeah, Let well, me have the last word, will you? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lady, you'll always have the last word. Uh, 
my my the big question that I have is similar to what Adrian has said. It seems to be generally accepted that the level of corruption in Asia today is unacceptable, but it is lower than what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, if there has been that kind of improvement to date, I don't see any arguments that have been addressed today as to why that improvement cannot continue until corruption is kept within uh, uh, acceptable boundaries. Well, I think the cause of the debate today was um, decided when both sides essentially agreed on the conditions such as transparency, etc., for corruption to be reduced. And so then it just simply came down to your view of the human animal. On the side of the affirmative, it was, if we know what's good for us, we'll change because it's in our self-interest somehow um, to, to do so. And the view from the negative was, well, history shows us that the human race has never known what's good for itself, and um, that's all there is to it. So actually, I look at the numbers changing over the course of this debate, and I don't think it's actually got anything to do with, it, with the eloquence or the arguments from either side. It's really, a, it's really an indication of whether we have optimists or pessimists out there. It seems like people started out pessimists and got more optimists as time went on. I'm afraid I've lived my entire life as a realist, so I'm going to come down with the negative for tonight. Not because we're never going to beat corruption. I think that's something we can't say. But um, in the short term, I think uh, human nature will tell. History suggests that it's going to be a difficult long haul. Um, I don't see it happening in the next five to ten years. Uh, I hope I live long enough to see um, the, uh, the affirmative dream come true. So we've got one dreamer, we've got one well, realist. Mm -hmm. Shelvai, we didn't get your final vote. Mm -hmm. Where would you go to? I think the, the Adrian's fence has now entered into my soul. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, as a judge, you can't sit on the fence. You have to pick a side. Where would you go? All right, I'll go with the dreamers. Why, why? Why yeah. do you feel the dreamers have won this debate? Well, I mean, if you've got to follow a dream or follow a nightmare, I'll <laughs> always choose the dream. <laughs> so it's a principled decision. <laughs> Which argument do you think resonated the most with you? I mean, you're a lawyer yourself. Yes. They've had some arguments about structures, governments, policies, yes. laws. Which argument resonated the most with you? You see, the, it appears that there are countries in the West that have uh, corruption levels which both parties or both both sides of the argument find are acceptable. Now, if that can be achieved in the West, I have heard no arguments today to suggest why that can't be achieved in the East. And that's why I'm staying with the dreamers. No, but I've never bought the, the, the point that Asia came into this game somehow behind the West, right? I think, in fact, this question, um, this debate question can be universalized. And the question is, generally, can people beat corruption? And I think actually the answer is probably no, because um, uh, it is part of the human uh, DNA. Corruption shows itself in the West. It's just in different ways. You have laws in place, then people don't display the sort of corruption that is criminalized. But believe me, influence, relationship, um, doing, doing things to gain advantage one over the other, it happens all the time. Um, so we get rid of some, you know, quid pro quo, uh, obvious payment for, for favors, uh, sort of corruption. Um, what's lobbying? You know, um, we, we talk about, we, we're worried about distorting market price. What's branding and marketing except distorting market price and passing the cost of that on to the consumer? We just substitute one kind of corruption or another. What's the ADB coming in and telling Asian countries, if you don't want to get our loans, well, if you want to get our loans, you've got to change your laws this way or the other. I mean, that's all just using influence one way or the other. So we just pick which ones we like. Um, but uh, I, I don't think you, you, you're ever going to root that out of our human soul. So I guess what you're saying is that corruption may, may not go away. Yeah. It might just go underground or take different forms. Take different forms. We, are, we really are infinitely corrupt, as, uh, <laughs> and that is the nature of the human <laughs> Truly human a very dilemma. different perspective from the dreamers on <laughs> either side of you. Thank you guys so much. Well, now it's time to find out who has won the first debate in this new season of Bridging Asia. All of you in the studio and at home, 
This is the time for you to cast your final vote. The teams are literally neck and neck right now, so your vote counts. When we first started, 44% of you said yes, Asia can beat corruption. 56% said Asia cannot beat corruption. So grab your phones, go to the internet, start voting now. Have the panelists made you change your mind? Make your vote count. Here's the final tally. When we started, 44% of you said yes. Now, looking at the poll, well, looks like 44% of you still say yes. It's gone back and forth. 43.3% is the final number right now. And 56.6% of you are saying no. So we started off, the debate swung to the middle, and now it's swung back. Throughout the course of this debate, we've seen more of you voting, and it looks like at the end of the day, the negative side has won. So the winners of this debate, Tunku Aziz, Dr. Florini, congratulations. And it looks like the audience have chosen their side. It seems that the majority of people think Asia cannot beat corruption. Thanks a lot. Good night.